Welcome, Wasp Nation. I bid you welcome. The Wasp U.S. Tour last year was a huge success with many sold-out shows, and now Wasp is preparing for their European tour that begins on March 17th in Manchester, England. The European tour runs through May 18th, ending in Bulgaria. Get your tickets now for the European tour at waspnation.com. Also available for the European tour are meet and greet VIP tickets. Take it from me, this is a great opportunity to get to meet Blackie in person, get a photo with him, get a couple of autographs, and take part in an intimate Q&A session with Blackie Lawless himself. You can also purchase your meet and greet tickets at waspnation.com. And last, don't forget, you can also purchase official Wasp Tour merchandise and exclusive classic design t-shirts at waspnation.com. Welcome. I bid you welcome. This is your host here, Johnny Metal. John Clauser, the Metal Dad, whatever you want to call me. I got my fellow wild one of all ages, my fellow animal, my co-captain on this little journey we call the Wasp Wednesday, John the Music Nut. How you doing, brother? I'm doing great, brother. How about oh, you? Oh, man. I don't know about you, but I'm still trying to recover a little bit from Elimination Chamber last night for the mm -hmm. wrestling fans. We're yep. not going to talk. Don't worry. We're not going to talk about it. That might be for another <laughs> video another time. But we are here because in my opening phrase, we get those iconic words. So, yes, Blackie, I'm sorry. I borrowed your I borrowed some lyrics for you. So uh, I'll see if I can pay you some royalties for it. But yes, today. We talk about Inside the Electric Circus, which, of course, the welcome I bid you welcome comes from that. Um, and it just fits great for uh, for my for this little series here. So uh, so what I'm going to go on first, as I have gone with the last couple of times. How this album was received uh, on the charts and things of that nature. Uh, so. Chart wise, we only have two singles, so that's going to be the easy part, right? Only two, only and only there's nine to five nasty, which uh, on the Finnish charts again, Finland, Finland, the place I always want to be. For Monty Python fans, you might get that one. Uh, chart uh, peaked at number 18, and the UK charts peaked at number 70. Um, and then in uh, 1987, they released I Don't Need No Doctor, which charted at 31 on the UK charts, did not chart here. Um, the album itself uh, on the Australian albums, the Kent Music Report. So Peter Kerb, tell me more about the, the Kent Music Report. Maybe you, maybe you can enlighten me on the uh, us on this one. Uh, peaked at 94. Uh, Canada top albums, uh, uh, number uh, 84. Uh, again, back to Finland, number 16. Uh, Norway, Paul, my buddy in Norway, uh, peaked at number 17. Uh, Sweden peaked at number 35. UK peaked at 53. And here in the US, it peaked at uh, 60. Um, I am not seeing anything about certifications for this album. Uh, I think it eventually goes gold at some point, but... Uh, it apparently did not go gold too quickly. So, uh, no real, no videos for this album for this one until they did the "I Don't Need No Doctor," which really tied more in with the live and the raw. But no promo videos, no no blind in Texas's, no wild childs, no no videos. So, does that help or hinder this album? So, um. We have a, a lineup change. So we we have we have uh we can we say goodbye to Randy Piper and we say hello to Mr. Johnny Rod. They're on the they're next to Blackie. Blackie would uh go on to playing bass, our rhythm guitar, excuse me. Uh Johnny Rod would be on bass. Of course, Johnny Rod being in uh King Cobra. 
Um, I was very familiar with him already uh, just from the Ready to Strike album, which I thought was tremendous. Um, I never heard anything good about the second album, so I couldn't really say much about that, but I loved Ready to Strike. I thought that was a very good album. Uh, and King Cobra was a good was a pretty good band on that one uh, with Carmine um, a piece, but um, uh, so we do have so we do have that change. So we have we this time we get uh, Chris Holmes strictly on lead guitar, and he gets he gets a few more songwriting credits as opposed to uh, Last Command, which I think he only had a couple. Uh, this one I think there's about four or five, maybe six songs he gets a co-write on. We get two covers, which we'll get into. But um, so with that, with that being said, John, take it away. Thank you, John. So on for this album, they toured with Iron Maiden as an opener, but it was only in Europe. Mm -hmm. And that would have been late 86. And in early 87, they played smaller venues, and they were headlining. They were playing places like the Ritz in Brooklyn, New York, the Chance in... Um, oh Poughkeepsie. Poughke Thank you, Poughkeepsie, New York. They're playing Cleveland Music Hall in Cleveland, Orpheus Theater, Orpheum Theater. Or I'm sorry, the Orpheum Theater in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Memorial Coliseum in Corpus Christi. Fair Park in... Dow Fair Call Park Coliseum in Dallas, but uh, Dallas, Pennsylvania, Dallas, Texas, and Aragon Ballroom in Chicago. So they were playing one to two thousand seaters as the headliners, and the openers they changed throughout. I mean, Saxon opened a lot of the shows, they were pushing Rock the Nation. Uh, Slayer played a lot of these shows, they were doing rain and blood at this point their magnum opus uh, they also had raven on some dates as well they were doing the promoting the life's a bitch album right early on in europe they did play some smaller venues and warlock was their chief support on that tour so mm. as for the album as for the album itself i think this was a step down as far as the songwriting. It was a more immediate album at first, but then after a few listens, I didn't think this album's pretty inconsistent, in my opinion. There are some good, strong tracks, but the fact that John had mentioned that there's two covers on here, in my opinion, back then, if you put out an album with two covers, and they were both fairly popular songs. It was a bit of a red flag. So, but we'll get into that with as we go over the tracks. The title, well, first off, you have the big welcome, which is the introduction to the album, and it sounds something like out of a carousel. Uh, it sounds like um something straight out of the amusement park, and it's it's a pretty cool way to open the album, and it goes right into the title track, which is a scorcher, excellent track where John borrows the um borrows from the chorus on that for his theme for this the channel here. That's a w wonderful opener. And then they go into I don't need no doctor, and that was a video on MTV, but instead of it being a theatrical video, it was just a live performance. So, and that was, I Don't Need No Doctor was originally a Ray Charles song, but then Humble Pie did a more rocking version of it. And that's the version that's probably the most well-known. Mm -hmm. So, so in essence, they were covering Humble Pie. And Humble Pie, that would have been probably, I'm not sure exactly what album it would have been. I, I, I think it's on Rocket the Fillmore. I don't know if it's on... I don't know their catalog too well. I'm not sure if it's unspoken or Eden or anything like that. If you're but, on comments, leave them in the comments for us. Help us out look, on that. <laughs> how are we going to look it up eventually? Yeah, we'll look it up. I mean, it, it's an easy one to look up. <laughs> but, but anyway, so but it's a good cover. Yeah. By, you know, Doctor. Nine Five Nasties, the next song, and that was a single. That is one of the strongest tracks on the album. It is 
a song that's more about hooking up with somebody, but it's not that sexually explicit stuff that you got with Sex Drive or Ball Crush or anything like that. It's more of a positive track. Another great track where the rhythm is carrying the song. There is basic, there's hardly any guitars in the verses. And the chorus is that it goes into the riff. Mm-hmm. And that's it, that's a very good song. It's a song that when we were talking about the 40th anniversary tour, it was one that I would have liked to have heard on the last tour, the tour from last year. But they didn't, they, outside of putting the track inside the electric surface in a medley, I believe that's all we got from this album. Mm-hmm. Next track is Restless Gypsy. That's a very good track as well. Um, another one where it's the rhythm carrying the song rather than the riff. It's got a very good chorus in it. This would have been a good single as well. I really enjoyed this song to this day. The last track that would be on the cassette or the vinyl is Shoot From The Hip. It's got one of the corniest choruses you'll ever hear. Um, it's it's okay. I mean, musically, well, musically it's okay, but it goes into that chorus. Got to pull the, pull the trigger, bang, bang, boom. I, I can't ever miss. I mean, it's just... I'm oh got a bullet bang pull the trigger boom I ain't never gonna miss that's it's it's kind of silly it doesn't for 15 years old maybe you dig it uh, uh. just really sounds so good now um but and they did that song live and we'll get into songs that they did live from this album in '86 and '87 a little bit later okay second side of the album I'm alive has this great galloping bass galloping rhythm like Iron Maiden. That's a very cool tune. I like I like that one quite a bit. From here, I think the album really goes downhill. They do Easy Living from Uriah Heep, which it's their biggest hit in the United States. It was their only top 40 hit in the United States. And they do a good version of it. And it would, doing a Uriah Heep song here would prove prophetic later because Ken Hensley played all, did a lot of work on their following studio album, The Headless Children. And on there, his work on those songs really fit in very well. Sweet Cheetah's the next song. It's average. It's okay. Um, another song, it's about more about the hunter and the hunted in relationships. I mean, it's it's okay. Mantronic, I don't like. It's just, um, it goes into a slow opener and then it goes into this opening riff that sounds a lot like somebody get, somebody call me a doctor from Van Halen too. It's, yeah. Okay. So that one I'm not a big fan of. And then the next track is King of Sodom and Gomorrah. That sounds a lot like Mantronic. Um, so the songs are almost interchangeable. I mean, I mean, they don't really jump out at you. Um, which it's sad to say because uh, on the last album I was talking about has his songwriting and his lyrics. Blackie did write some stuff that was very explicit, but he was writing a lot of creative stuff as well. Here, not so much, in my opinion. I just don't think these songs really hold up. I I didn't like them then, and I I still can't get into them. The Rock Rolls On, though, is in a very good closer. That's the nice anthem to end the album. It's, uh-huh. yeah, that one's that one's pretty good. So, if I were to rank this album inside the Electric Circus, I'd give this a six. Because there is some very strong stuff on the first half, and I'm Alive is very good as well. Yeah. So... Yeah. All right. That's, that's good. That's good stuff there. Um, yeah. So for me, this album holds a lot of strong memories of when I would go back to listen to them. And I, and I, and I, and I was thinking back to when I'm, when I first got the cassette and I'm starting to listen to it and I'm driving my girlfriend nuts and, you know, then, uh, you know, the next relationship I would have, uh, you know, we'd be listening to a lot of these songs a lot. So I have very, very fond memories of listening to this album in, in my car. So um, 
uh, again with the big welcome you gotta love that ladies and gentlemen boys and girls and wild ones of all ages that's great you gotta <laughs> love that i mean that that whole intro and well there's something else and then of course you go into the inside the electric circus song great great track so glad to hear that one uh at the concert uh, last year um it really just sets up the perfect atmosphere for the con for the concert experience, whether it's whether it's Wasp or whether it's whatever band you're seeing. I mean, it really is. It just sets up that stage, and it's a perfect perfect song for that. Um, I don't need no doctor. Um, again, was a live staple for a while for for Wasp, and so it was kind of sad that they didn't include it on this tour. Uh, except I think maybe David Applezar got to see it in uh, in California, and that was one of those right. early dates. Um, again, a very well done cover. Um, I thought it was, uh, a, well, you know, for them, it was perfect for the a perfect song for them. Uh, nine to five nasty. You gotta love that. I don't know if you ever saw the single cover for this, but it's got the, it's got the girl with the, uh, uh she's in a one piece, uh, bathing suit and she's squatting next to a, uh, next to like a big weight dumbbell kind of thing. And, uh, so not really sure what the correlation was there exactly, but uh, 95 Nasty still a great song. Uh, another one I can, I, I, the memories of me listening to this song in my car with, with, uh, with a girlfriend and we get to that part. Uh, uh, we get to the part where she says, uh, uh, come on, baby. I mean, business, I'm going to show you what liberated means. You know, uh, I would just look to her and she would sing those. She would be like lip syncing the lines to it. <laughs> it's like, nice. it was, it was perfect interplay. We had so we, again, we had a lot of fun listening to that stuff. And we, maybe back then I didn't quite care so much about um, the, the little things I care. I think I look back on now and I'm like, Oh boy, you know, it was a, it was just a it was a great song and I enjoyed it. Restless Gypsy is probably my favorite track from this album. I absolutely love uh, I love that track. Um, it uh, it's always been a, a favorite to me. Um, it just speaks a lot because I think there's like that again that the desire to have uh, something you can't have because you're just constantly roaming the streets. So yeah, so this was just a great song. There's uh, Restless Gypsy, just again, just kind of that you're on the road because you can't stay in one place, but you find someone that you wish you could spend your life with kind of thing, but they're not, maybe they're not ready to move on with you. So I don't know. It, to me, that was a, it was an endearing song to me because I, I just, it was another one I just fell in love with. And I loved Blackie's voice on it. It wasn't that Absolutely. higher register. There was like, you know, there's it was a much somber sounding voice for the most part. It was and it just fit perfect for the song. Uh shoot from the hip. Well, again, like you say, it's great when you're a, a late teenager into your 20s, but now that you're in your 50s, yeah, I gotta shoot it, bang, boom, shoot it from the hip. I got it loaded, bang, pull the trigger, boom. No. <laughs> i'm sorry i just after uh, it's just it's it's fun when you're it's fun when you're back then but yeah not so much now you could definitely tell it was just a kind of a filler track um side two i'm alive kicks off with his love song to the pmrc in my opinion uh to me i think this is this is probably my second favorite song off this album i love i'm a i love i'm alive love that chug and rhythm love Holmes is tasty guitar solo with even with the tapping fells, but again, it just it spoke it really spoke to me uh because I think I, I could see where the whole oppression thing and and the you know the whole idea of the government and it, he was probably poking fun at religion as well. Mm -hmm. You know, anybody that was trying to I guess get your morals straight and all that kind of stuff. Right. So I get that I got that back then because I think I was an angry young kid at the time. So I got that, but yet you go into easy living. And it was funny as I was listening to this in the car and my, my wife was in the car with me and I had the song playing and she's like, well, at least there's, 
at least there's something kind of Christian going on in the car. List, you know, because the you know the song is like you know easy living, and I've been forgiven since you've taken your place in my heart. Right. You know, and that's a you know if, if for those, especially if you follow Blackie's life now, and you know him professing his Christian faith, you know a song like Easy Living that's that 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 means something to a lot of people. Maybe it's not. It's not how I would call the the Christian life per se, you know, because it certainly doesn't. It's not made to be easy, but right. uh, it's still a very powerful song. And I believe, it, even though it's not credited in the in the in this reissue, uh, I believe Ken Hensley does play the organ on this song. I believe so he I, does. I, I, I believe he does uh, actually uh, take place on this. But uh, that's probably my that's probably another one of my favorite songs. Like you, after that. This it kind of loses steam for me, you know. Sweet Cheetah, good song again. It's fun to fun to sing when you're when you you got your girlfriend in the car, um, you know. But uh, uh, Mantronic, uh, I I I think the best way I can describe Mantronic is like uh, like a sexual Terminator. Yeah, you know. I don't know. Maybe that's where I, I uh, the King of Sodom and Gomorrah again. It's a song about life on the road and just how crazy it can get. And just how hedonistic it can get, uh, but the rock rolls forever on. I mean, a great closing song uh, for the album, which uh, I, 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 I had, for those of you, um, for those of you who may have this little uh, do-it-yourself CD I did a few years ago, I put this little track at the end, and I shared this with my good friend John, the music nut. And uh, it was a song that I, I, and I think I talked about it in the first episode uh, called Sadist. And, and I'm going to confess the verse for that, uh, for the song. I, I have to be honest, it's, it's probably lifted a little bit from the rock rolls. You know, there's yeah. never a day that's passing my way and I live without it. You know, and my song kind of has that same kind of feel. In the room of doom with a full moon in the sky. There's, so there you get a little bit of lyrics from that. But I, I kind of had that lyrical flow of, of of the rock rolls forever on. So sorry, Blackie, I borrowed that one. But don't worry, it's never going to be released to the public. Anyway, <laughs> nobody wants to hear that song. Anyway, um, there's only two only two B-sides that they list uh, as as extras on this thing. Uh, a song called Flesh and Fire. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, you know, again, kind of a sports metaphor thing going on here. It's okay. Not, I could, it makes for a better B side. Unlike the previous right. album with Savage, much better song. Yes. But this one, I would not say that. And then we have the lovely, goofy acoustic slide of Douchebag Blues. <laughs> <laughs> I first heard this one on if for those of you who have the videos in the raw uh VHS uh they play that at the end credits kind of thing and that's uh <laughs> yeah yeah just a throwaway track it's just it's just them just goofing around in the in the studio and that's pretty much it um this Blackie has gone on record saying this is probably his least favorite album of the bunch yes um, I, I wasn't at my Q and a, but again, for those of you who got to go to the VIPs to the Q and A's and you, and you put your videos out there, you all put some great gold out there. You really did. He tells a story where he says, I saw my, I saw my face on the magazines and all of a sudden my head became as big as this room. And I lived that life of the rock star, you know, with the booze and whatever else. And it, it ultimately resulted in a crappy album. And he, he was referring to this. And, you know, I didn't think it was crappy back then. I think back then I probably would have gave this about an eight or a nine. I'm kind of like you now. Uh, I'm probably more like a 6.5. Okay. You know, it's not a very high up on my on my ranking, but you could definitely tell Blackie does not have a lot of, lot of love for this album. But then let's talk about this cover. Yeah. <laughs> let's just talk about this thing. Uh, you know, so the, 
It was, uh, uh, as you, I think you helped me out with this one. Joanne Gare did the body paint. Yes. Uh, a fellow by the name of Dick Zimmerman was the photographer. Um, uh, I heard some crazy stories in interview, in, in interviews where it, it, I think the cost to do the body painting here was something like 150 to $200,000. I don't know if that's true or not back then. I can only imagine, but, uh, it seemed like that's, I was hearing, I heard, or I read some kind of crazy numbers. I don't know if that's really true or not, but, um, anyway, I think what was another uh, quote that Blackie would put out here? This was, this was being done by a very tired band, you know, and I guess it showed, um, uh, there's really exactly. not a lot of danger in this album quite so much. Not like you, not like you experienced with that first album. You didn't have those those fighting anthems like like last command or running wild in the streets but you know you got a lot more toned down you got you know blackie produced this one it was still at the pasha sound so you get the you get Dwayne baron i believe on on engineering um and a little and hans hans peter hans peter huber again but you don't have you don't have um spencer proffer being the main guy behind it all Yes. But you do get a much more slicker, much more polished sound. So was again, maybe in eight, maybe 1986, 87 or so when I got this, it ticked all the boxes for me. And that's what and I just gravitated to it, you know. But as I just don't feel like time has has gent has been gentle to this album. So so with that, John, take it away with some more good thoughts and uh statistics and other things that you picked up on this album another thing i remember back in circus magazine before this album came out blackie lawless was predicting a phenomenal success by album three before this before it came out he said the third one's going to be the one that takes us over to the next level and it, there were a few other albums by bands where they were ready to break and then they put out something that it seemed like it was reined in it was too tame and and this i think is exhibit a um where they were on the cusp but they just had to put out another strong album because the momentum was there and the fact that you put out a a cover is your first single and i know motley crew had done it with smoke in the boys room the year before but i think that's a bit of a red flag and i said two two singles, um, I'm sorry, two covers on here. I think that's not a good sign. I think when the album went up to number 60 on the U.S. Billboard charts and it just dropped, I mean, I think it just sunk their momentum right there. And then immediately they just went out and headlined smaller venues instead of catching on to a, a big tour again. Yeah, um, they're only able to do it in Europe for a little bit with Iron Maiden, but uh, yeah, they um, it, they went. Uh, I mean, there's there's some albums like this. Y and T down for the count was like that. It looked like they were going to go right to that next level, and they put that out, and it was very, it was very reined in and slick, and a lot of keyboards, and I think that stopped her momentum and they made so many great albums after that. But mm -hmm. at that time that they needed the great one it they put out something that was very reined in and safe same thing with keel um their album from summer 87 that would have been yeah. their third major release album and final frontier was really keeping the momentum up on that one so they put out the self title one 87 they get the slippery when wet tour opening for bon jovi but the songs weren't really there and um the wrong single too they just they really somebody's waiting as the single and there were other tracks on there like don't say you love me i think which would have been better and there was a lot more keyboards on that album too here it wasn't so much keyboards it was just the songwriting wasn't as strong and the, the fact that they had to rely on two covers and there nine five nasty i think would have been a better single would the album have done a little better yeah but i don't know if it you know, it still wouldn't have made it as strong an album as the, the two before that one. No. And certainly what was going to come later. 
Yeah. One of the things I looked at when I looked at this, uh, when I looked at like tour statistics, mm-hmm. they didn't tour this album very heavily. No, they I mean, didn't. probably about, I think between 86, 87, they only played about 70, 80 shows, maybe, you know, it wasn't all this album did not, they were not playing for three years on this album or anything like that, like, right. or, or, or a full, a full year. I mean, it was, you know, a couple, a couple of months or so, and it was done, you know, it's, you know, and I think what, uh, I think like the Long Beach Arena show when when you know when they do the live in the raw. I mean, I think that was recorded in March of '87. Yes. You know, they didn't play another show in '87 until Donington, right? You know, in eight, and that was in August. So there's a there's a long period where there's nothing. You know, so and then that that was it. So, but yeah, I mean, let's let, let's talk about let's talk about these opening bands or that they were with. Oh my gosh! We, we, I mean, thinking of, thinking of Wasp and Warlock on the same thing. I yeah. mean, just just seeing my girlfriend Doro. Sorry, I love Doro, but and I, and I love and I love True Steel. That was such a great album back in the back in '86. Absolutely love that album and Triumph and Agony. It was also really good too, you know. And I like a lot of her solo stuff. But I mean, my goodness, that would have been a great show. But Raven, Slayer, and Wasp on the same bill first okay so let's let's look at this right rain and blood you get 30 minutes of pounding in your face sledgehammer pretty much okay uh raven's life's a bitch they finally get back off the the poppy stuff that they they leaned more towards on stay hard and uh pack is back you know they get that heavier sound that that angry sound and of course they would eventually be released off of Atlantic to go on to uh combat for a little, for a little bit with the nothing exceeds like success or like excess. So you get that. So we do, but then when you get, you get the way this was and you got to follow Slayer. Right. <laughs> Ooh, not me. <laughs> I wouldn't have wanted to do that. Not after. Oh not. A, I mean, I, I don't count Rain and Blood as one of my favorite Slayer albums. Actually, that's Hell Awaits. But but I don't. I I know fans were would have been in a frenzy. And then for 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 to come with Wasp to come out with what with what they were doing. Yeah. It's total mismatch, in, in my right. opinion. In my yeah. opinion, so Saxon, I think would have been a was would that would have been a good uh, a good bill, you know. But I think Saxon wasn't uh, you know, they weren't being pushed all that strong either because they didn't really have a whole lot of singles and stuff like that going on. And I don't, you said which album that was that was that was for you thought it was for Rock the Nations, and on that album they were really trying to be more of an American band, and I didn't think that album was very good at all. Yeah. Um, so again, that maybe that might that it would it would have been mismatched for a totally different reason, right? I mean, let's 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 kind of look at the landscape of what else was coming out in '86. Peace sells, but who's buying? Yes. Um. It's let's see. Like Master of Puppets. Master of Puppets have been out earlier that earlier in the year. Uh. Let's see. Ultimate Sin from Ozzy. That was a that was actually a really strong album. It was a very um, big album for him. Let me think. Um. I'm trying to think of some other big releases that were out at the time, but more just, more hard rock, but Cinderella Night Songs was a huge hit. Yes, there you go. That was that and was Roger another good one. Wet was a monster hit. Monster hit. So you get you get some really huge competition out there, and if you're not if you're not either a ticking the boxes of strong songs, or you're not you're not tip, you're not checking the boxes with the speed and thrash and and just the ferocity. You're not. You, you, unfortunately, your album is going to go by the wayside. Yeah, and I think that's what happened here. Mm-hmm. They didn't. The Strongs weren't strong enough. weren't strong enough. It didn't have that thrashy veracity, that viciousness that you had from the first album, and it just wasn't going to tick enough boxes for a lot of people. Right. And as much as I hate to say that about my guys, I got to do that. So, yeah. but you know, it's it's what happens. You know. Um, you know, I think they would eventually they will uh, and we'll we'll be going on this on the next episode more than likely. But, uh, you know, they gave us this live in the raw. Yes. So um, 
we'll uh, we'll we'll talk more about that uh, on the next episode. So, John, if you've got have you got anything else you want to throw out? Only other things, um, songs they played live from this album on the tour. Um, Inside the Electric Circus, right into I Don't Need No Doctor, right into 9-5 Nasty, which we'll talk about that next week. They did those three consecutively on the tour in, you know, first three songs. They also did Sweet Cheetah, and they did, near the end of the set, they would do Shoot From The Hip. So okay. it, was those, it was those five songs that they played Right, I mean, they, they would usually do about three at three from the first album and three from last command. Okay, so there you go. So there was your there was your basic set list from uh, from that time period. So, mm-hmm. all right. So that's all that I've got. If what are, for for those of you who are listening or watching this, what are your? Did you get to see the band on any of those seventy to hundred shows during this time period? If you did, what were your thoughts? What did they sound like? What did you think about it? Like, share, subscribe. You know all the YouTube lingo. Let me know in the comments what you thought. Give us give us some some feedback. Let's uh, let's let's. I want to I want to hear some interaction with you guys. I want to I want to know what you yeah. what you Wasp Nation folks are are uh, feeling about this about this time period. So, um, with that said, until we go in the raw next week. This was my music corner. This is Wasp Wednesday for my co-captain, John the Music Nut. I am Johnny Metal, the Metal Dad, John Clauser, whatever you want to call me. Until next week, we will see you, hopefully, in the raw. <laughs>